Society. Uh, there are new members, new people here. Welcome, uh, old members. Welcome. Uh, we have two more programs this summer. After tonight, uh, we don't meet in August. And uh, the program next month, I need your help. I need a lot of your help tonight. I need your help. It's going to be on the schools in Squirrel Hill. And Betty Connolly is going to start it off. But it's going to be a participatory evening uh, to create an art <coughs> and oral history of the Pittsburgh schools using our nice video machine. We need you to come and be ready to talk about your school experiences in Squirrel Hill. And if you have memorabilia that you can show around, like you know, prom, uh, prom programs, whatever, please bring them along. <coughs> this is one of these programs that can turn out to be one of our best or worst, depending on who comes and who talks, OK? Uh, in July, we have a, a little bit different. Uh, the owner of the tea shop is going to come and talk about the history of tea and teapots. Something a little different. Uh, I am gradually working towards uh, the program for next year, and Sandy Baskin, who's one of our members, is going to uh, speak in October. It's the first of our programs. He's going to talk about some some aspect of remembering Squirrel Hill from living here. We'll get an exact title before too long. <coughs> I've handed out sheets for a walking tour this Saturday at 10 o'clock in front of the church for two hours going around the neighborhood uh, with Jim Reich, who has spoken to us to great applause this last month, I think it was, time passes. Jim was <coughs> head of the business association here for a long time. I am undersubscribed right now on this walking tour. And I don't want, that's never happened before, and I don't want it to happen Saturday. So I would like very much you can pay at the door, as it were, and it's only 2 or $3 anyway. I'd like very much to have some of these filled out at the back so we don't just have four or five people, which we have right now. Now, on June 6th, we have a walking tour. Chatham, our speaker tonight, will be part of the tour guide there. Actually, we have a lot more signed up already. Mellon Hall at Chatham University, which is uh, the, the Mellon Mansion, is going to be where we gather, and I will call everyone who signed up and remind them before the 6th, because we won't have a meeting before then. We also have sheets in the back for the Chatham Hall, the uh, Chatham Walk, and we like to cut this out at 25, but right now we still have a bunch of room. Okay, so that's, just for those of you who are new, we're a membership organization. We'd love to have you join. We have membership forms in the back, but you're welcome at any time. We're, 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 we're a, a, a cheap thrill. You can come in here without joining as a member and enjoy our lectures. As, as uh, we, we have 30 or 40 people here now, and that's become pretty regular without extra uh, great view, good marketing, but without all sorts of special efforts. People know we're here on Tuesday nights once a month. Tonight's speaker. Well, let me stop for a minute. Any questions about the walking tours, the remaining lectures this summer and the fall? Anyone who wants to come up and recommend speakers to me, do that individually as we build our program for next year. We know that what the, the speakers programs keeps this group going and we'll try to get a good, exciting group again for next year. We'll have a historic group from another neighborhood to be selected to come and talk, and we'll do a, our normal now mixture of local and, and, and more general topics. Beth Rourke, associate professor mm -hmm. at Chatham, is, I call her the patron saint of this organization. Mm -hmm. um, I always do that. Uh, those of you who've enjoyed the uh, Squirrel Hill book, some of you know and some do not know this story, that. We used to exhibit at what used to be the, uh, the Squirrel Hill happening on Saturday, one Saturday. And we had a table, and Beth came up one day and told people that she, Chatham had this collection of photographs that included Squirrel Hill that was underutilized, and that we had access to it. And meantime, Arcadia Books had been trying for many years to get us to do a book on Squirrel Hill. 
it, that came together, and about 60% of the photographs in our Squirrel Hill book came from collections at Chatham, which Beth provided to us. But Beth has already done two or three lectures with us. Um, this, I think it's fourth, fourth one. We try to have her come back a lot, and you'll find out soon enough why. And so I'll have Beth come on and talk to us about the history of Pittsburgh and prints and photographs. And welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. I was just telling Mike I was running out of topics that deal with Pittsburgh and Squirrel Hill, so I don't know if I'll be back. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about two collections that we have at Chatham University. One is our print collection, the Catherine Miller Collection, um, which will be the bulk of my talk here. Um, and that's a collection of prints in all media, um, metal plate engravings, wood engravings, lithography, um, just the whole range uh, that date from about the late 18th century to the late 19th century. And then we have this other collection of photographs in slide form that were the basis for um, the Squirrel Hill book and collected by Arthur G. Smith, who wrote the first Pittsburgh Then and Now book that was published back in 1990. Since then, there's been another published by Walter Kidney, but this was the first one. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Smith collection when we get to it. Um, we won't see a lot of photographs. I realized by cutting it off at 1900 that we don't have a lot that's pre-1900. We have some from just around 1900. So I'll just give you a taste of that collection. Um, Chatham's collection, which uh, Harley Trice the third, I don't know how many of you know him, an old Pittsburgh family, um, called the best unknown collection of Pittsburgh prints because it's not out there that much. His works on paper, we can't show them um, continually. We've done a few shows in the gallery that, that include them. Um, Catherine Miller gave them to the college in 1965 along with some paintings that we'll look at and a watercolor I'll put up first. Um, it was a collection that, that it, it was clear that she really had no um, concern about anything but the fact that it dealt with Pittsburgh. Some of them are like the lowest quality illustrated newspaper prints, and others are, are high quality luxury prints. Um, she was the daughter of our first female trustee and attended Dilworth Academy, which was the prep school for women at Chatham College, or it wasn't, it was Pennsylvania College for Women back then, between 1897 and 1901. And when she passed away in 1965, she gave the collection to the college, and there were about 50 images altogether. Again, she had very eclectic tastes. Um, as long as it had something to do with Pittsburgh, it was okay with her. And so we have a real range of quality and provenance and she exhibited them once during her lifetime at Pittsburgh's 200th anniversary, and you know that we just celebrated our 250th. So in 1958, she opened her home in Sewickley where the prints were displayed and invited people to come in and see them. Um, she also lent them to Stephen Laurent to illustrate his book, Pittsburgh, The Story of an American City, which was published in the 50s and is still today the best pictorial history of the city. So if you go looking through your Laurent, if you have one at home, notice how many of them say, courtesy of Catherine Miller underneath. This print's included in the book. Um, I kind of stumbled across the collection when I was working in the Chatham archives researching our Tiffany window, which I think was the first talk that I gave here. We have a beautiful Tiffany window that had been kind of missing for many decades and was found and restored and reinstalled on campus a number of years ago. And I was looking through the archives, which at that time were a total mess, and there was a cabinet that had all of these unmatted and unframed prints. Um, and I, it was clear that nothing had ever been done with them. I think when they came to us in 65, they probably were put in that drawer and nobody ever looked at them again. Except for maybe there was one time when our collection, our art collection at Chatham was assessed for insurance value. And I think that they were looked at at that time. I think that's because I was the, there's always only been one art historian at Chatham. And I'm the first Americanist, the first person who focuses on American art. Everyone else was like a Renaissance or a French 19th century specialist. Um, Harley Trice 
came in because of this watercolor. There was one being sold at auction in New York City, and he knew we had this one, and he wanted to compare the two. And in looking at it, he looked at the other prints and gave me a sense of the value of the collection, because I had never really studied printmaking before. And so I made it a project for my American art class to research and exhibit the prints in 1999. So we had to show up the prints then. And um, that was the first time, really, that I had researched Pittsburgh history. I'm not native to the area. I grew up outside Philadelphia. And I became really fascinated with the, er with the area and its history. Now, the first thing you need to do, obviously, when you found a city is, is map it. So the first, the earliest works in the print collection are maps of Pittsburgh. And they date from the late 18th to the early 19th century. And two of the prints come from an 1826 publication by Victor Collot called Voyage dans l'Amérique Septronale, which means Voyage in America in the 17th century. And um, our version is actually hand colored. This is something dealers would generally do. They would, you know, they take books apart, books of beautiful images, and then they'll give them to a, a watercolorist to hand color them. The original, without coloring, you can actually see at the Darlington Room at Pitt. They have a volume in English. Um, there were only a hundred <coughs> copies printed in English, and only um, and three hundred printed in French. So we're actually you know, have one of the um, English copies, obviously. And you might wonder about the dates, as it says there. This is Pittsburgh in 1796, which is when um, the French officer, Victor Collot, was ordered by the French minister to the United States to, as he said, create a minute detail of the political, commercial, and military state of the western part. And so you can see, at this point, development was pretty much Development is pretty much limited to the point. You can see Fort Pitt there, and there's references here that tell us that the shaded areas are islots, which I'm assuming means lots, and it says these are the lots that are most developed. They're almost fully developed, and you can see again it's just a small area along the Mon by Fort Pitt. <coughs> The other parts I think are fascinating are the hollows that go back from the river, some of which still exist, others have been filled in. And um, there's one, I know you can't read it, but I'll point it out. Um, there's a little inscription over here on what would be Mount Washington today, today but, but at this time was called Coal Mountain. And it says, um, let me read it so I don't get it wrong. Um, Spot from whence one has a view of the towns, forts, and rivers. So it's functioning then, it's the same way Mount Washington functions today. People would go up there to look at the city. It's also one of the first areas to be mined in Pittsburgh for its coal. Again, it was called Coal Hill. It makes sense that what it's really focusing on are um, the forts. <coughs> you know, Fort Pitt there, there's a fort over there called Fort Lafayette, which probably strip district today. And then there's two smaller forts um, built by General Anthony Wayne. Because this is, this is 1796, there, we have not yet um, really emerged as, a, as an urban center at this time. So um, the reason that the prints are dated so early and yet published so late is because the prints actually were produced in 1804. And yet, after the Louisiana Purchase, the French lost interest in the United States. So they sat around for 22 years, and then some, so someone finally pulled them all together. Collot, again, was the designer, and um, the engraver was Antoine Francois Tardot. Um, it's a metal plate engraving, which means he would have had to carve the lines into the metal plate, and then it would be run. And then again, someone at some point went in and hand colored it. But this is a particularly nice example of hand coloring. Sometimes it's just very sloppy. And it actually makes the prints worth less today than if it hadn't been hand colored because it's a later edition. The other map we have, I have to apologize for the lighting. I was taking these on a slide, you know, viewer table, and this print was a little too big. It's actually a fold-out map of the River Ohio that was also done by Collot. Um, the Ohio was Difficult to navigate at this time in 1796, and its banks contained many Indian settlements, 
there's a, um, there you might be able to make out some writing. It's called Mingo Town, which was a town of Mingo Indians along the Ohio. And it was, you'll also see there's, ri there's numbers in the river which mark, um, you know, its depth. So that was evidently of concern. That, that block of writing there says, um, the most dangerous parts of the navigation down the Ohio finish at Mingo Town. Now, it's, it's, these prints are exceptional in their detail, in their clarity, the beauty of their engraving. There's fascinating hints to development to come. Like, here, here's Pittsburgh right here. And just south of Pittsburgh, it says M period Keysport, evidently McKeesport. And over here somewhere, it says Beaver Town. So um, again, it's very interesting, I think, to look at these. The very bottom, it says Wheeling Island Town and Fort. So at this point in time, in 1796, we don't have views of the city. There really wasn't a reason for them. It was, so you're still pretty much a, a frontier outpost at this time. And there was no print industry in the city. There were no printmakers working in the city. And there would be none until businesses developed enough to need images of themselves and the city. The collection has two other maps, which I actually earlier, we think, one is kind of a mystery in terms of its date. Um, this is one that we know the date of. This, was, this is also an engraving, a metal plate engraving, that was done for a book published, as you can see, in 1766. So it's probably the earliest print in our collection. And um, again, it was part of this book, an historical account of the expedition against the Ohio Indians. And it, it tracks the route of Colonel Henry Bouquet and his army of about 150 men whose mission was to find the easiest route to Illinois by way of the Ohio River through Indian country. And there's um, a lot of Indian settlements marked along the river. I'm not quite sure why it's in French. I think there was also a French version of the book. Um, but many know Camp Indien, I-N-D-I-E-N. -E the march began at Fort Pitt, which again you see here, and it ended at Muskingum which you see over here in Ohio. And there were also, I think, Muskingum Indians there. Um, along with Bouquet's army was Thomas Hutchins, who was an experienced engineer and cartographer. And he was the one who was charged with keeping detailed notes on the river, its course, its depth, the strength of its current. Um, Bouquet, of course, was the chief executive officer under General Forbes when the British reclaimed or claimed the point from the French. Um, the early maps, again, really present Pittsburgh as an outpost. Um, but there are evidence of interest in the region, interest particularly from abroad. The map that remains kind of a mystery to us is this one. It's in really bad shape. It's on very fine, tissue-thin paper. And as you can see, it shows Braddock's route into the city. Um, which wasn't really a city at that time. It's an engraving as well, very delicate engraving. And you can see how damaged it is. It's really suffered from water stains and evidently was folded at some point. It has at the top, it says Braddock Roof, Braddock's Roof, AD 1755. Um, I know they've been doing a lot of work on the French and Indian War and on Braddock. Um, and I actually emailed a group that was working on this, I think up at Slippery Rock or one of the colleges north of here, and they didn't seem very interested because they never emailed me back. But you can see here's Virginia, here's Maryland. Um, he spread, started in Maryland and kind of worked his way through the Allegheny Mountains to Turtle Creek, which is marked there. And um, as those of you who know your, your Pittsburgh history, know that um, Keith Braddock was mortally wounded during the battle, which the English lost. Um, Braddock insisted on fighting um, with by the book military strategies, while the French and Indians either had read the book or chose to ignore the book because <laughs> they did not. They used a lot of guerrilla attacks and things that just decimated Braddock's army. So the, these are our, our, our few maps. This one I'm still interested in finding out what the source is. Someone told me if I researched the towns that are marked, I might be able to get a sense of where uh, or when this was published. Chronologically, and this is kind of roughly chronological, not strictly chronological, but kind of roughly chronological, the next image from the Miller Collection is the view of the arsenal that probably dates from about 1820 to 1830. And it's in really exceptional shape. It's a, it's a large image, about this big. 
and it's on kind of a, a almost like cardstock kind of paper, very thick. And it depicts Allegheny Arsenal in Lawrenceville, which was designed by Benjamin Latrobe, who was the chief architect of the US Capitol building. It was built during the War of 1812. Um, they needed, at this point, point in time, a large and well fortified <coughs> arsenal in Pittsburgh, which is evidence of its strategic importance, and again, its status in 1812 as a frontier city. It was built by the federal government to provide ordinance for the country's western expansion, and the land on that it was, pur it was purchased from um, Stephen Foster's father, who owned most of what is today Lawrenceville. It's showing it from the Butler street side, and so the um, Allegheny would be over on the other side behind the trees. Um, it shows the main arsenal in the center flanked by officers' quarters on either <coughs> side, and I think some of the things that are kind of charming about the scene, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little tavern sign here that has an eagle, <laughs> and all of the doors are represented open. Not quite sure why, but they're all open, running down there and over there. Um, it's clearly the product of a self-trained artist. There's typical things that you see in folk art, or artists who are self-trained. One is an emphasis on patterns, and you can see that he's emphasizing, or she's emphasizing the patterns created by the leaves and by the bricks and the windows, and that clearly it's an artist who had only a, a kind of a rudimentary understanding of perspective in the way those houses recede fairly dramatically. I mean, the fort is still there, much larger. Is that a water thing to do? Yeah, that's well, actually one of the is ways they trashy? dated it, is it's a well. Yeah, yeah. It's like trash <laughs> yeah it doesn't look like trash cans. Of course, this is where the tragic, um, I think the, the worst industrial accident during the Civil War took place in 1862. They used young girls and young boys to um, pack explosives because they had small hands. And in 1862, um, the arsenal blew up. The worst, again, worst industrial accident during World War or during the Civil War, killing dozens. There's a monument to them in Allegheny Cemetery. Um, Manufacturing at the arsenal ceased in 1868. The buildings were still used for army storage until around the turn of the century, around 1900, and they were abandoned. And parts kind of disappeared. There's still some parts left. Now, I, we have a lot of views of the point in our collection. That clearly was an interest of Miss Miller. This is the earliest one, published in 1858, though it shows the city in 1840. And uh, Victor Polo, again, when he visited Pittsburgh in 1796, predicted a future of, of great glory for the city. He wrote, placed at the source of one of the noblest rivers in the world, this town, when the Indian frontier is thrown back and the roads are rendered practicable, will certainly become one of the foremost inland cities of the United States. The general aspect of the country is delightful. So even in 18 or 1796, they were predicting good things. And you can see that in these views that appear around mid-century. By the 1840s and 50s, interest in Pittsburgh was growing. We have artists living in the city, both printmakers and painters. Um, and the public was fascinated by Pittsburgh's rapid urbanization and industrialization. Um, again, this was Created in 1840, not printed until 1858. It was from the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey, which was published in Edinburgh. <coughs> One of the reasons I know all this detail about where this, the source of these prints is because of the show that was at the Frick last year called A Pittsburgh Panorama. Great catalog. <laughs> it gives you, that's really filled in my knowledge on these prints in many ways. Um, about five of our prints were in the show. Um, the, the curator, Christopher Lane, runs um, a print shop in Philadelphia, and he's also a frequent guest on Antiques Roadshow, and he just did a brilliant job. If you're interested in prints and the city history, find the catalog for um, you know, Pittsburgh, or Panorama of Pittsburgh. He proved that this is kind of an unusual view, actually, because it's um, from Grants Hill, so we're looking at the city kind of, um, here's the Allegheny on this side, 
And um, we have some cows, and apparently this was a favorite picnic spot, this particular perspective on the city. You can see back there is St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, the courthouse would be over a little bit. I think it's, it's not in the image. The back of this print calls your attention to um, the canal that ran between Penn and Liberty at this time. There was an aqueduct that went across from the north side to what is today the north side. I'll show you a picture of it later, but there was an open canal between Penn and Liberty. And we actually have two versions of it, you know, two versions. One is the black and white that I just showed you. And again, another one is hand colored, but not very well. One way you can tell hand coloring is that the color tends to run outside the line sometimes, or it overlaps. And that wasn't something that you could do with printmaking at this time. It isn't until closer to the end of the century that you have colored lithographs coming about as a medium. I think actually it makes it a little bit easier to read, though, with the color. It's easier to see some of the forms. Um, this is the only view from this perspective. And it's thought that it was made with something called a camera lucida, which is the reason for its kind of sketchy appearance. A camera lucida was. Um, a mirrored optical device that reflected the image um, onto a piece of paper, kind of like a camera obscura. Um, our best image of the city, though, is this one. This is a, a luxury print. It's large, it's on very thick paper, and it was done by, um, we're very uncertain about the name. It is does have a signature, but it looks like Doom and Klondike. That's not a name I've ever heard. But you can see that it was printed in Nuremberg. Evidently, by this time, the early 1840s, people abroad were interested in Pittsburgh as well. Um, and this really, I, I think, gives a sense of Pittsburgh's growth at the time. And it shows you one of the popular perspectives on the city, which is from the south side, looking across. The point is down there. You can see all the river traffic lined up along the Mon Wharf. And um, two landmarks that you can see in most of the prints. It's a way to kind of keep your eye on how the city's growing. One is the second county courthouse, which was built in the 1850s, 18, around 1851. Oh, no, no, it, wasn't, it was built earlier than that. Sorry, I'm getting confused. And across from it, St. Paul's Cathedral, but St. Paul's without its steeple. So this is fairly early. We did this about 1842 to 45, because you still have a covered bridge going across to the south side, which means that it was done before the Great Fire of 1846, which destroyed that bridge, and a suspension bridge was put in its place. And again, the building suggests that it would have been after 1842. Um, and it's, again, it's a real knockout. You really don't see it so well here, but I think you can see by the delicacy of um, just the foliage in the foreground. Most of the images of the city were done in a landscape approach called the picturesque. There were, in Europe in the 18th century, three approaches. Um, the sublime, which was the, actually sublime in its 18th century sense meant something kind of horrifying and terrifying, like thunderstorms or volcanoes. The beautiful, which was you know, classically balanced and beautiful. And then the picturesque was kind of meeting of the two, but it tended to emphasize the symbiosis between man and nature. So often you'll have cityscapes framed by foliage, and you'll see these kind of beautiful, um, kind of balanced um, approaches to the, um, to the composition. And that's typical here. Um, we also have a lithograph from around this time. As you can see, lithographs, that last one was also a steel engraving, an engraving on metal plate. Um, lithographs are different. This is it's thought the early lithographic image of the city. And here we're down the Ohio, looking back, or at Sawmill Run, looking back towards the point. And again, you can see the city courthouse up there and St. Paul's across from it. Um, lithographs are done on specially prepared stones. Stones, usually lithostones, are very thick, very heavy, and they're treated to make them reject ink. And you draw your design on the stone, so there's none of that laborious carving that's involved with engraving. And the drawing, you draw with kind of a waxy crayon, the drawing attracts ink, 
And so when you ink it, the, the stone rejects it, the drawing sucks it up. So many lithographs look like drawings. You can see that kind of softness in the line. Um, again, this is a very early lithograph. Um, one thing I found out, or actually I guess we, know, we knew this, because <laughs> I have it in my notes from an earlier time, that this was in the Western Literary Magazine in October of 1843. And again, it's got that kind of standard picturesque approach, which often involves kind of framing the city on either side to focus your attention. Um, we've got some river traffic. It's also interesting to watch what kind of riverboats we have. And you'll notice more attention to industry here. Remember, at this time, smoke was not pollution. It was progress. So you see more and more of this as the city develops. We have a, two prints that are almost identical. Both are based on this print, which unfortunately we don't have. And it's a print that again shows it probably from maybe a little farther down from Sawmill Run. If you look back at the city, there's the courthouse, there's St. Paul's, which has, actually no, there's St. Paul's, doesn't have its steeple yet. I think that might be Third Presbyterian at the time. And this print was done for Graham's Magazine, and it's very high quality engraving, um, but it was based on a painting by a man named Godfrey Frankenstein, yeah, Godfrey Frankenstein, who um, it has painted by Frankenstein over here. <laughs> I know, it's kind of odd, odd name, but, um, <laughs> but the original was, would have been an oil, oil painting by Frankenstein, who was a landscape painter from Cincinnati who had worked in this area. His painting is lost, so keep your eye out for it. You never know where it might turn up, and it would be worth quite a bit. Um, the Frankenstein family were from Cincinnati, a family of German immigrants that were all artists. <coughs> a couple things you'll notice in this work, which again is thought to be directly from Frankenstein's painting. Note the figure on the side here and the river traffic, and again, all of the smokestacks. It was kind of funny because I knew of the Frankenstein family. I had done um, a, an internship, or actually it was a postdoctoral, predoctoral fellowship at the National Museum of American Art, which is now called the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and they had this portrait of Godfrey by his brother John Frankenstein, and I wrote an article on it for the Smithsonian American Art Magazine. You see him working their shared studio in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, here's a detail of Godfrey, the landscape painter. Um, he specialized in landscape painting, was particularly known for his paintings of Niagara Falls, of which the Carnegie owns one. This is the one the Carnegie owns. So next time you go to the Museum of Art, keep an eye out for it. It says Godfrey Frankenstein. Unfortunately, all of his views just were blown out of the water by the most famous image of Niagara Falls by Frederick Church. Church did a broad panorama of the falls and kind of puts you in the falls, whereas most artists backed up to show more of the falls. So <laughs> John Frankenstein, Godfrey's brother, wrote a, what can only be described as a screed in 1864, a 112-page poem called American Art, Its Awful Altitude, in which he shreds the American art scene, just everything that's wrong with it and um, particularly church. He says he had a lot of nasty things about church for honing in on his brother's specialty. <laughs> so the two prints that we have that are based on the Frankenstein painting or that engraving are these two. One, oops, my words got a little mixed up there. One's from Gleason's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion. This is one of the first illustrated uh, newspaper-like um, publications. And you can see here that the river traffic is different, and there's some different people on the path. But essentially, it's Frankenstein's um, composition. And again, you can see in the background there, you see also you know, something I didn't point out before, the industrial development on the south side, or what at the time was um, Birmingham. This one is an, an illustrated letter sheet. Again, it's engraving. This is wood engraving, which tends to be a little bit rougher than metal plate engraving, and this is actually a le letterhead. You can see down here it says Pittsburgh without the H. We were talking about, prior to this, we were talking about you know the H, and you'll see it kind of come and go in the print. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Um, and then it has 
room for the date, and then it says 18 blank, so you would fill in that. It would probably have been a company in Pittsburgh that wanted this kind of letterhead that showed, again, the burgeoning industry. There's even more um, riverboat traffic here. We've gone back to one single gentleman who looks like he's carrying oars. But again, it's essentially Frankenstein's painting, again, with the courthouse and St. Paul's there. Um, of course, there was no copyright in the 1850s, and views were liberally copied. No you know, penalty for that at all. That was the case as well with this. This is also a letter sheet. Um, and it's based on a very famous print of Pittsburgh by um, Benjamin Smith, which is this image. You find these in many print collections in the city, and they range from these giant versions down to these quite small versions, which is this one. Here again, you can see we're on the south side looking across at the Mon Wharf, which again has got river traffic up and down, um, you know, paddle wheels, steamships. There's actually a schooner over there. I don't know that that was ever you know, on <laughs> the three rivers, but it looks nice. Again, we've got that picturesque style framing of the city and more and more industry. We've got the courthouse and St. Paul's, which now has its steeple. Um, we go back to that letterhead. You can see how it's based on the Smith image and has two vignettes. One vignette is of the courthouse, and the other vignette, I think, is the market house or the post office. Um, uh, you write it down. Oh, no, here it is. County Courthouse and the Custom House are to be represented there in the vignettes. Now, a pictorial letter sheet was published by Charles Magnus and Company, a New York form, firm that did cities all over the country. And this was done before the standardization of postal rates. What determined how much you paid was how many pages you had and how far it was going. So Magnus took advantage of kind of a loophole and would create kind of one large sheet that you could fold into an envelope and have a lovely little picture on it. And so you could send it cheaply because it was just a single sheet. And that's the way this would have functioned. Now, we also have a series of prints that kind of deal with the history of the city. This is Fort Duquesne. Um, it's a beautiful print. It's a tiny little print that is done, again, for a magazine, Godey's Magazine in this, in this case. And it's important, note who painted it, Russell Smith. Russell Smith was probably the first professional landscape painter in the city. And he moved here in the 1830s and 40s. This was published in 1844, again, in Bodie's Magazine. And it shows um, the magazine used for storing weapons and gunpowder at Fort Duquesne, which, of course, was you know, destroyed by the French before they left the point, and then Fort Pitt was built. Um, Again, Russell Smith is the best-known Pittsburgh landscape painter of this period, and he did many, many drawings and paintings of the area. I'll show you some more that are owned by Chatham. Um, among the first to move beyond mere documentation and illustration to depict the city with the eye of a fine artist, and you can see that here, how he's kind of isolated the magazine against the Allegheny River in the background, um, and it's, it's very much using artist license because the ruins of Fort Pitt were kind of all around it and you don't see it here. He was focusing on what's, what's beautiful about this scene, kind of the isolated mag magazine with men, I guess, kind of standing up on top of it. Again, he documented the city in a series of oil sketches in the 1830s. And um, he took these with him when he went to Philadelphia in the 40s, where he lived um, until the 1880s. And in the 80s, he thought that there might be interest in pre-industrialized Pittsburgh, or you know, the time before it really became the industrial titan that it would. And he had all of these sketches. So he did many, many copies of those sketches. He gave a whole set to the Historical Society. He, a number have ended up at the Carnegie. And these are the two that were from the Miller Collection. Um, one shows the aqueduct, which again went across the Allegheny River. That's some, some details about that. Um, it, again, it, was, it linked the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal with this aqueduct over the river that connected with the canal between Penn and Liberty Avenues. 
And we're seeing a view of it from the carriage shop. There's a little carriage shop here with some carriages being built. And there's our kind of surrogate, the little man who's standing there looking out at the scene. Um, it's a little hard to tell in this image, but there are actually you know, traffic on the aqueduct. There was a towpath and walking paths. And the Carnegie has an almost identical view. Again, next time you go to the Museum of Art, you know, once you come into the skate galleries, you go to your left and your left again, and you have a whole bunch of Pittsburgh images. That's there. This one lives in our president's office, so you can't really see it. At Chatham. The other one is the old blockhouse, the city's oldest building from 1764. There's a little, um, you, know, you notice and recognize the blockhouse here. I guess though there's been some debate about a building that may actually be older than the blockhouse that they're trying to preserve in the city. Um, it was Fort Pitt's only standing remnant, um, but in the 1830s it was domesticated by Major Isaac Craig, who had served at Fort Pitt. He added a brick two-story home to it. We see a lean-to with a, some wild pumpkins growing <coughs> and laundry out here and, and kind of different bits of wood. <laughs> I don't know if Smith meant this as kind of a critique given you know, that the blockhouse is so important for us historically. But it's, it was like that for most of the 19th century with that additional house on it that people lived in. We also have um, documents of important events in Pittsburgh, and of course the Great Fire is, is a you know, very memorable event. This was actually done by Nathaniel Courier, as you can see here, of Courier and Ives. It was before he joined Ives. And um, the Great Fire uh, was April 10th, 1945, destroyed over 50 acres of property and 1,200 buildings with damages estimated at the time at $9 million. So imagine how much that would be today. It began when a washerwoman lit a fire to boil, boil water to clean clothes, and then the flames quickly engulfed about a third of the city at the point, and then leapt across this wooden bridge to the south side, destroying a good bit of Birmingham at the same time. Bells from the Third Presbyterian Church, which is here, um, rang warning people that the fire was was, was getting out of control, and store owners and others carried their possessions down to the edge of the Monongahela River. So you see lots of people here watching the fire, and lots of people out on boats watching the fire, including one that looks like it's, or two that look like they've caught fire. Um, amazingly, there was a tremendous amount of damage, but only two deaths, which really you know, has to be an act of God. Um, Nathaniel Courier, you know, again, half of the well-known printmaking team of Courier and Ives, made fire scenes an especially popular subject. Most major cities had a big fire at some point during the 19th century, and he would travel from city to city. Um, his first one was a fire on the Lexington steamboat in Long Island Sound in 1840, and one of his last was the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. One question, though, is was he really here? I mean, it's a very strange view of the city if you're trying to kind of locate yourself. Again, we're kind of on the south side, I guess, but we don't see the point. And then I guess he wanted to include the Allegheny as well, so it's, it's kind of up there, but it's really, really a leap for those mountains behind the Allegheny River. Nothing quite like that in Pittsburgh. So, but it does have some things that suggest that you know he was here at least um, you know, to see the way the city was situated. Now, fire prints and other disasters were very popular in the mid-19th century. Um, this is a print of the burning of St. Paul's Cathedral, which we've been looking at, you know, from a distance for quite some time. Um, St. Paul's was built in the Gothic style in 1829. This, again, was published in Gleason's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion. Our print actually has the rest of the sheet with it, so you can read about the fire. Um, and it tells us that while well, it was placed on top of one of the hall, small hills that kind of littered downtown at this time, um, and it caught fire in 1851, attempts to control the fire failed due to primitive equipment, which you see there, and according to Gleason's, quote, a brisk breeze, which was blowing at the time, and the extreme height of the structure, it being situated on an eminence of 20 feet above the level of the street. 
So we'll be talking, hopefully, run out of time. Um, we'll be looking at a photograph that shows the grading of Grants Hill. But before that happened, there were a lot of these kind of bumps downtown. And obviously, things have been carved out around St. Paul's. Now, a new church was consecrated on the site in 1853. In 1901, Henry Clay Frick purchased the property, property for $1,325,000. St. Paul's moved out to Oakland and began to build the beautiful cathedral there in 1902, and Frick put up the Frick building <laughs> right across from the courthouse, a little bit of competition there. Um, another fire print, which actually doesn't show just a fire, but the Great Strike, of 1877. This is the Union Depot and Hotel, um, and it was apparently one of the most elegant um, railroad hotels in the nation. Uh, the strike started in West Virginia in July of 1877, and it spread rapidly. Pittsburgh saw um, some of the worst violence. It spread throughout the country from New York to California and um, government intervention was required to bring the strike to an end. Um, Harper's Magazine had five artists in Pittsburgh when the strike began, um, and they did large-scale wood engravings, which was still kind of the cheapest way to go at this time. I and mean, these are good-sized prints that, again, would be in Harper's Magazine. Um, Shell, this is by Fred Shell, and it shows the burning of the Union Depot and Hotel, considered one of the most elegant railway stations in the country, on July 20th, 1877. The strike began when freight crews left their trains to protest a 10% cut in wages and increases in the number of cars and the length of the trips without a commensurate increase in the size of the crews. Now by midnight um, on July 20th, over 20,000 men and women filled the streets of Pittsburgh, about a quarter of them armed. Hundreds of freight cars and locomotives were set ablaze between Washington and 33rd Street. The total damage estimate was you know, $7 million. I mean, there you know, would be worth a lot more than that today. Um, during two days of rioting, 150 were wounded and 61 people lost their lives. So you can see the, the crowd here. One of the artists in town who did prints for Harper's was John White Alexander, who had become a very famous portraitist and also execute the grand, the mural on the grand staircase at the Carnegie. Beautiful mural um, was by John White Alexander. Um, we also have one other print related to this, kind of an odd print from Frank Leslie's Illustrated magazine. Um, the militia was called out by the Pennsylvania governor at the time, Governor Hartrand, who coincidentally, when the strike broke out, was on a tour of the western parts of the country on a car provided by the Pennsylvania Railroad president. So in response to the labor riots, he ordered a 1,000 soldiers from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh to disperse the strikers. And this was the first time that federal troops were used to put down a strike. Um, they didn't succeed in breaking the strike until August 1st. And this shows Hart Tramp in, um, you know, how to tell who he is. He's <laughs> clearly it's a portrait, whereas the other faces are kind of generalized. He looks very much in control. This is right around the time when things were, you know, wrapping up nicely for him. And um, I love the two little boys over here, kind of the Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, who <laughs> seem to be admiring the, the soldier. Um, he. His intervention was key in breaking the strike that was considered the most violent and destructive in the United States to that date. I mean, we've all heard of the Homestead Strike, but I don't think many of us have heard of the railroad strike, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Now, the last category in our collection are um, Pittsburgh architecture. Ms. Miller must have been fascinated by architecture, but it's, it's kind of like Rick Seebeck's special documentary, you know, things that aren't there anymore, because mm -hmm. most of these things are not there anymore. <laughs> Including this building, it depicts the origins of today's Passivant Hospital <coughs> in the Parent Deaconess Institute. Um, it was staffed by four Protestant deaconesses from Germany, and it first began to accept patients in 1848. This, I think, is about 1851. Um, it was founded by Dr. William Passivant, 
um, and was located on Fleming Street above the North Commons at the foot of Montgomery Hill, which is now part of the Hill <coughs> District. This too is, I, I think, clearly done by a self-trained artist. Um, in, I think that makes it more charming. It's kind of naive representation of perspective. It's a two-tone lithograph using black and white on kind of a buff color sheet. So you can see where the white areas kind of bring up the details. And there's a large building, it was probably the hospital, and then some homes, a horse-drawn carriage, and there's actually a little cemetery over here next to the chapel. Um, it's not in good shape. It's got water staining, and when you see paper, works on paper that have these dots on them, that's called foxing. And it happens when there's too much moisture. But it is something that actually can be reversed by a paper conservator. I keep hoping we'll get a grant or something so we can conserve some of our prints before they're gone for good. I've mentioned the courthouse a number of times. We have two images of the courthouse. One that was in Frank Leslie's, oops, something happened in my text again there, from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, and the other from Ballou's pictorial drawing room companion. And it's interesting to compare the two for what the artist <coughs> emphasized. Um, it, this was the second courthouse in Pittsburgh. It was completed in 1841 and considered the most monumental building in western Pennsylvania before 1860. It was designed by John Chislett, who was probably the most important architect in Pittsburgh at that time. There's still a building downtown that exists from Chislett's design. He also was the superintendent of Allegheny Cemetery and, and laid out the cemetery there as well. And he's buried there. Um, the prints illustrate the same building, but they look very different. One artist emphasized the architectural detail of the magnificent dome, and the other not interested in that at all. He's got a general dome. As you can see, it's in the neoclassical style, which was most popular for government buildings at that time, which is why Washington, D.C. looks the way it does. <coughs> the neoclassical style, of course, has all kinds of associations with ancient Greece and ancient Rome that um, governments like to associate themselves with. It was one of the few buildings to survive the Great Fire of 1845, but it was destroyed by another fire in 1882, and it was after that that the Richardson Neo-Romanesque courthouse that we know went up. Um, another thing that's not there anymore, uh, the Pittsburgh Exhibition or Exposition, these were a series of buildings where the stadiums are today across, you know, here's the Allegheny, there's the point over there. We can see that there's a covered bridge that's reaching across to, again, what today is the north side. Many cities had these large exhibition buildings where they would show off their goods, showing things like um, furniture, carpets, photographs, mechanical devices. It was <coughs> a huge thing, as you can see, um, many, many buildings dedicated to it. Um, it was destroyed by a fire in 1883. They built another one that lasted into the early part of the 20th century that was much fancier than this one. I like this print because it actually kind of shows the artist drawing it in here, observed by two um, people. It's, it's called a panoramic print because it gives you so much detail. Not only can we see the um, wooden, the covered bridge, but also a suspension bridge. Um, I think that might be the one that was designed by John Roebling. I'm not positive. I know that it did go across the Mon, and Roebling, of course, um, did the Brooklyn Bridge, which is what he's most famous for, his greatest suspension bridge. And we also see one incline there on Mount Washington. You know, at one point it was littered with, with inclines. I think there were close to 20 inclines. Um, our, one of our last, this, <laughs> I always wondered why Western State Penitentiary, but this was a really popular subject, not just for prints, but for plates. There was a whole, there was an English firm that did a series of plant transferware plates with the image of Western Penitentiary on it. Um, <laughs> they, they did fascinate people. Um, this one was originally on the north side on the West Common in what was then Alameda <coughs> City. Um, it was one of the first prisons organized, it was opened in 1826, one of the first prisons organized under the Quaker system, which was a move away from corporal punishment, which stressed isolation for the prisoners, 
who could only work in their cells. They wore black hoods when they were moved from their cells to other areas. They would have no contact with each other. Um, and they were given a Bible to encourage them to reflect on their sins. Um, this was actually ended up being more psychologically destructive than corporal punishment, that kind of isolation. There's an article about it in the New Yorker a few months ago that um, really talked about how being isolated from other people was very damaging psychologically. Um, Eastern State Penitentiary, which was built around the same time in Philadelphia, still stands, and it's a tourist attraction today. It's all run down, and there's been all kinds of paranormal groups that have gone in there to find yeah. ghosts. <laughs> um, Dickens came to Pittsburgh primarily <coughs> to see the prison. Uh, he went to Eastern State Penitentiary, and they came here. He thought the Quaker system was horrific. He thought that it was you know, just not the way to go. Um, he ended up staying while he was here with the Schoenberger family, who gave much of the land that became Allegheny Cemetery and had a beautiful villa that was a superintendent's home until they tore it down. Um, our last print it was a, one, again, that I really knew nothing about. It's Cunningham and Incense Glassworks. I assumed that it might be stationary, like some of the other stationary we've seen. But it turned out to be from um, a book called Manufactories and Manufacturers of Pennsylvania in the 19th Century that was actually kind of a vanity production. It was a whole group of prints that the people you know, paid to have put in the book. But I think it's interesting as, as a glasswork, since Pittsburgh's first industry was glass. It was located at, on 22nd and Jane Street on the south side. And it became Cunningham, Cunningham and Impson in 1865. We date this to about 1875. Um, again, glass was a crucial industry in Pittsburgh throughout the 19th century. Pittsburgh glass went everywhere, from Maine to New Orleans. You know, one of the wonderful things about Pittsburgh is the river that made trade so much easier. Um, in the 1860s, when Cunningham and Impson were active, Western Pennsylvania was the nation's leader in glass production than a $7 billion enterprise. And, and this type of composition is called a vignette. It's where it kind of blurs out at the edges and kind of an oval shape. Um, I'm gonna end with, well actually, I'm not, let me see, yeah, I'm running out of time. I have to go really fast through the photographs. This is one of my favorite little prints and it's the latest one in our collection, the, the most recent from 1885. It's a wood engraving, and it's tiny. It's only about this big. And we knew it was from a book because you can actually see the print on the, on the back side through the print. But we weren't sure where it came from until they did the show at the Frick. And it was from a book called The Peculiarity of American <coughs> Cities, 1885. It's wonderful. Again, it's so tiny, and yet there's so much detail. We see some glass works over on the south side. Again, we see the suspension bridge from the point and the wooden covered bridge that goes over to the north side. Um, I guess we're a little too far this way to see the courthouse and St. Peter's, but here's, again, river traffic on the Mon. Um, it's hand colored as well. It's been hand tinted, but um, again, I think it's a really charming, charming print. Now, um, I thought it would be interesting, even though this is way beyond my time frame. <laughs> I'm not quite sure when this image, maybe those of you who've been around a while can look at it and see if you can figure out when it when this image was taken. 1930s. 30s? Okay. Because we have the, the Wabash Bridge being dismem dismembered there. I think that's the Wabash Bridge, and that's when we still had um, bridges coming from the point. Yeah, the point bridges. The railroad yard. Uh huh. Yeah, and then it's a big railroad yard. Yeah, I think I just thought it would be an interesting contrast with the last image we looked at, even though again it's you know like you said probably 1930s. Um, we have a collection of thousands of slides created by Arthur G. Smith, who was a history professor at Chatham, and again wrote the book Pittsburgh Then and Now, and also did lots of courses on Pittsburgh architecture. And I think he must have visited every archive of the city. Almost all of the prints that I showed you, he has in slide version, plus all of these photographs that are from Pitt, it's a historical society. Um, he's I just picked out a few because, again, there's so many. 
Um, and this collection came to me when I started at Chatham in 96. He just recently passed away and they were slides, so they figured that the art historian would be the only one who would know what to do with these. So I got about 20 boxes of slides, about this big, you know, those slide boxes. And this was the collection that I just began to explore when I went up to the booth at the Squirrel Hill Happening. I realized in going through it that there were really important images in there. Um, there's very few before 1900. There, there are a few, but photography wasn't very, um, it was too expensive for the most part up until around the turn of the century. This is one of the early, early ones. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we, we play around with some of these in Photoshop to bring up the details, but we lost the sign that says undertaking and embalming livery stable, 1720 Harrison Street. And this is right around 1900, and you can see all the workers have come out. Some are looking through the windows up there. And you can see a hearse over here with a rider and the horses. Um, one of my research areas is cemeteries and cemetery sculpture, so I do a lot of reading on, on death. And in kind of professional embalmers or undertakers really didn't come about until after the Civil War, when the need was so great during the Civil War. Before that, it was handled in the home, primarily. And among the first to um, do this kind of work were the um, liverymen and carpenters, in part because they were building the coffins already, so they just added embalming onto their, you know, <laughs> list of skills. And uh, they also owned the horses. The livery stable had the horses that would pull the hearse, and you know, people didn't buy their own hearses. This would have been, it's typical of a late 19th century hearse, which was, you know, glass through and had, you know, lamps and columns and, and all kinds of embroidered stuffs inside, really very, very fancy, Pil carved pillars, urns, lamps, and interior draperies. This one I just thought was kind of funny. Um, here's Oakland around 1900 from our collection. It shows Oakland in its early cultural development. Oakland was the part of our city that was most impacted by the City Beautiful movement, which began in Chicago in 1893 with the Chicago you know, World's Columbian Exposition. And it was, it was the reform <coughs> movement that believed that making cities beautiful could promote harmony and improve the quality of life and reform social ills. And much of what Oakland looks like today is because of the City Beautiful movement. You can see here that this is the Shedley Hotel, now the <coughs> Student Union. It was the first skyscraper hotel in Pittsburgh. This land, of course, is all developed now. In the background, you see the Carnegie before its um, 1906 edition. So it shows um, the curved facade of the music hall. If you go into the Carnegie today, they've got that grand kind of entryway. Behind that is the music hall, and it's curved. That used to be the front of the building. And there were two um, towers on either side, which were based on a famous Venetian building. I can't remember which one. But Andrew Carnegie really disliked them. He called them the donkey ears. So <laughs> that didn't last very long. The other thing I want you to notice is that there's a hollow underneath, um, or between, next to the Carnegie, there's the library. You know, Eventually, that, all, that small structure held all of the various departments of the museum and library. But there's a hollow there and a bridge across it called the Belfield Bridge, where today is Shelley Plaza. Um, it was soon realized that the building wasn't big enough. Within a couple of years, they realized the building was just not big enough for what they wanted to do. So in 1906, they built the Carnegie the way we recognize it, bringing it up to Forbes, taking down those two donkey ears, and um, creating a huge dome space inside, which is the Hall of Architecture. I worked there for about seven years, so <laughs> I know the building very well. And this That's is a uh, postcard. It's not a postcard. Is it? But there is a lot of postcards. Yeah. I th I, this one we had down as a postcard, but my only information, the reasons these don't have long titles like the prints, is all I have is what William Smith or Arthur Smith wrote on the slide itself. A lot of these could use a much more um, research, which I just don't have time to do right now. Um, the I brought in one from the Squirrel Hill History book. This is one of the slides we lent. And so it's in the book, and it says around 1900. I don't know if that's right or not. And those of you who've read the book and know Squirrel Hill's history know that it was slow to develop as compared with to Shadyside in Oakland, in part because it didn't have trolleys that ran this way until about 1900. 
and also, and that this shows the tracks. And also, there were large estates and farms, but by around 1900, it began to be subdivided, and it was almost completely built out by 1930, which is why we have so many you know, beautiful homes from the early part of the 19th century. Um, what plot is it? This is, is, this is Forward Avenue. It's now Picasso. You know how Forward comes down and kind of ends yeah. by what used to be the karate place and the yeah. BP yeah. station. And, tracks there, and this is track. going back up towards Whiteman. Oh, wait a minute, but they have tracks on that street? That apparently. <laughs> well, this, I, I, this is what's in the book, which I'm assuming someone researched, because the slide itself says that it's Forbes Avenue, not Forward Street. But I went with what was in the book, because I figured that was more correct than, than what. They have tracks Forbes Well, maybe it's Forbes. I don't know. It's, it looks more like Forbes. Yeah, maybe that's right. Forbes is there. Well, it said Forbes towards Whiteman on the side. That's more like Whiteman. Yeah, but that's more flat, too, because it's like really a steep that's street. Is that more towards Whiteman Street? Towards Whiteman. From where? Town or the other direction? Um, coming from Squirrel Hill and towards Whiteman, which does kind of go down a little bit. Well, maybe we were right to all along with this wrong. Yeah, is that from Murray? Yeah, that, well, that's the question, is what we're looking at. Again, it could use more research. I think that's Forbes. Forbes? I think it's Forbes. The only one that tried. Okay, then maybe that's right. I had to bring in a couple of you know typical Pittsburgh steam scenes, the Edgar Thompson Steelworks, which we just went to Kennywood for Mother's Day. It's kind of a tradition in our family. Just looking at the steelworks across the river. This one we didn't have any information on, but I think it might be one of W. Eugene Smith's photographs that he did in the 1940s. Um, very famous photographer, one of many who came to town. Um, by 1910, the population of Pittsburgh was about a half a million and a quarter of those were immigrants. Um, I said we had some images of the grading of Grants Hill. Um, this actually took place over about 70 years. They first started to grade it in the 19th century, but the major grading, the final excavation, took place between April 1912 through January 1914, and it lowered some areas of the street almost 20 feet. So you can see the buildings kind of hanging up there. <laughs> this looks to me more like domestic structures and um, stores, <coughs> there isn't any signage. Um, they removed 143 cubic yards of soil between Diamond and 6th Street, and this was what was used to fill that ravine between the Carnegie and Hillman Library today, where it was Shedley, um, what well, is Shelley Plaza? They completely buried the Belfield Bridge, so it's under there. <laughs> but they just completely filled it in, and it's I think where it is now is where the Frick Fine Arts Building is, where which is where I got my degree in art history. Um, and the excavation resulted in over 2.5 million dollars of property damage to buildings downtown. The entrance to St. Paul's was stranded about 15 feet above the ground, and as we know, many of the buildings. Um, like the courthouse and the Frick building, the, where we enter now is the basement. Mm -hmm. And the grand entrances are on the first floor, which are up 20 feet or so from the street level today. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really, it was a major undertaking, but it was really important because the, the hump, as they called it, slowed construction and prohibited the use of horse-drawn wagons, which they needed to transport <coughs> units at this time. Um, again, it ha took place over 77 years, but the main <laughs> one was uh, between 1912 and 1914. My last slide, again, we have lots of, oh no, this is my last, this is another view of the Grand Hill. You can see some, you know, some signs. My last slide, we have a lot of slides of Pittsburgh events, as you can imagine, so I had to, thought I'd end up with the Great Flood of 1936. <laughs> Um, as we know, I mean, we live here, flooding is a constant you know, issue in Pittsburgh. Um, over the last 200 years, 11 out of 17 floods happened in February, March, and April, which of course is when things begin to melt. Um, we apparently did not have very good flood control in 1936, which is why the city was so decimated. Um, the primary cause was prolonged precipitation in the region, first as snow and then rain. 
and then more than 63 inches of snow, um, warmer than average temperatures, melted at all. It's also called um, the St. Patrick's Day flood because it took place on St. Patrick's Day. And, um, and the whole kind of point area was inundated. Some streets were under 20 feet of water and had to, people had to be rescued from the second or third story by rowboat. So um, people still love disasters, I guess is my point there, because <laughs> we saw them in prints. Um, and now we're seeing them in photographs. So that's just a little taste of our Smith collection. Maybe I'll come back and that'll be my topic. <laughs> Thank you. Sponsored tour of uh, Chatham. And again, use the website to sign yeah, up or leave the forms now. Chatham is a, has a real parking problem because it's neighborhood locked, and whenever we try to have parking spaces, the neighbors you know, get all up in arms. Um, Mellon, Andrew Mellon Hall is the large Mellon mansion. It's really hard to miss. If you take the first right after Shady, if you're coming kind of towards Oakland, take the first right there, follow it through. You know, it's a beautiful neighborhood. Notice the Richard Meyer House, the white one, very famous architect who designed the Getty Museum, and behind it a Robert Venturi home. Venturi wrote um, Learning from Las Vegas. It's one of the, he's one of the great postmodern architects, and they both sit there, um, and then a bunch of other houses that were older. And just follow that down, you'll get to a three-way meeting point, and if you go make a right, you'll see Mellon Hall, big building on your left, and we'll be hanging out kind of on the front porch there. Again, parking is an issue. A Saturday 
in the summer should not be very bad. There's a few spots in front of Mellon, but if you keep going down the hill, there's parking all along Chapel Hill Drive, which is the road that leads up to the chapel. You just have to kind of park and then walk back over to Mellon. And Paul and I have been, um, we've never done this together. We've done it separately, so we thought we'd join forces. There's been a lot of research done, a lot of it by my students, on the mansions that line Woodland Road that are now part of the college. Most of them are dorms, but some are administrative buildings and our alumni house. And um, the building that I'm most familiar with is our Arts and Design Center, which used to be the old gym and was turned into studios and, and facilities for our, our design programs, our graduate design programs, and our undergraduate visual arts programs. So I'm hoping we'll get to see just about everything while we're there, because it's all really interesting. And I hope we can see the Tiffany window, too, which is just a knockout. Are there any questions to Beth before we wrap up? Thank you, my friend. We'll see you next month. Uh, this is about the fifth largest attendance we've ever had. Thank you.